when you really think about fashion, you think about runway shows, you're thinking about the industry, you're thinking about glamour. When you talk about black fashion, you suddenly realise that some of that's kind of missing. We saw it reflected often in white designers' work. So you saw a version of blackness, know it to be appropriation, but at the time we didn't have the voices to be actively challenging what was happening. No matter where you go in the world, you'll always see that, that blackative. Michael Jordan's footsteps were all over the globe. Everybody used to have the cap backwards. You turn the cap round, that's the way that it goes. As one of the curators of this project, it was really important for me to be able to tell a story that hasn't been told. My question, which was obvious, was well, what are you doing about the period that's missing? The past cannot exist without its archive. In order to understand Wayne Pinnock, you kind of have to have a sense of Nelson Mandela. Those connections are often hidden or dismissed. It's not been an easy story to tell. It carries an awful lot of weight. This whole conversation came out off the back of the murder of George Floyd. I still have to look back and think, is that what it takes for me to be able to tell my story? We can't get away from it. You know, the, this, this whole story is about context. For our white counterparts, being a fashion designer was just about making nice clothes, because that's what we were doing. But for us, it was a reflection of our everyday struggles. Like, much like hip hop tells stories, black fashion designers were often telling stories in their clothes. The archive will tell folks that we were here. You can take away my freedom, but you can't take away my sense of belonging, my sense of home. That DNA is still there. Once I stop thinking about that, I'll lose so much of me. The home conversation is, is really central to our identities as black Brits. That starts with your parents. It was about this notion of the, the land of milk and honey. And of course, when they got here, there's no money and the honey was sour. I felt like the people who'd come before us or me, you know, they paved this way to make my generation's life a bit easier. There wasn't an awful lot of representation in film or TV for people of color, let alone people who were queer. So it was a case of me just coming to England and doing my thing. I was never lassoed by the thought that I didn't belong here. My first experience of the National Front was as a seven or eight year old. So the idea of what was home to one and what was home to another were two very different things. As our parents have often told us, you need to be twice as good as the white man to be able to get ahead in life. And if I'm having to face the National Front with fear of my life as a seven year old, then I have to do more than twice to be able to sit here today. I feel as British as you can be, you know, I like kippers on a Sunday, I drink tea, and then I, I would go to the West Indies and not feel that at home, but I should do. And then I come back here and I don't feel at home here because I'm not looked upon as very British. This whole um, attitude about your roots, where you come from, where is it? Is it Africa or is it the West Indies or, you know, England? I'm a man of the world, I, I've decided. I'm not set in any one place. For me, the artistic life is never about settling. <laughs> so naturally, I think that you have to then have a sense of homelessness. Homeless then means then you are then not then beholden to particular kind of locations. Home to me is London. It's the most beautiful city because it's such a cosmopolitan mix of people. It's global, it's everything. You're not confined. I was this black kid into goth and punk and rock. Straight away, you are then don't fit. And the place that I felt home outside of the family was in a nightclub called Charlie's. People weren't allowed into pubs, they weren't allowed into clubs, or there was a colour bar in a number of those places. It was one of the main places where I found people from all walks of life, different colours, different backgrounds, under the same umbrella doing the same thing and in the same mindset as me. All the senses kick in the sensuality of the materials that people were wearing or dressed in the club. To see somebody in one of your dresses having a fabulous glass of champagne in somewhere fabulous, it's all right by me. 
Work and play all merged. There wasn't any separation. It would be working on whatever clothes, mixing with people like Bruce Oldfield, Michael Roberts, Manola Blanick, Riffa, Osbeck, models like Marie Helvin, going to the embassy, going to Monkbreeze. It was just non-stop, really. I was such a big clubber when I was in my 20s. I loved it. I'd make something specially for the night, club till four in the morning and get up and get to uni for 10 o'clock. My mother said to me once, if you're going to go to a club every night of the week, you should get a job in a club. So the next week I was working in heaven in the cloakroom. For those six hours or four hours, you could be anybody that you wanted to, to, to be. There is a sense of liberation, but also a sense of desire. Wow, amazing days. It was all about nightclubbing. It was all it was about. Still is. <laughs> the word performance, it sounds like it's not real. But with that said, I do believe that identity also is a form of performance. My parents, they would send photographs back home and they would find the nearest posh car and they would stand by this posh car dressed up in their suits <laughs> and their Sunday bests. And they would take these photographs, send the photographs back to the Caribbean to show how great you were doing. You just have like these dandies, peacocks, holding their head up high because you may only have a pound or a penny in your pocket, but you're just like you've got a million dollars. Church day was the dress up day and everyone dressed up. It looked kind of like a Christian Dior fashion show. Women wore big hats and gloves and I watched very closely and I learned the tricks and I learned how to make it look effortless just like they did. When I think about dressing, it's like, who am I today? What do I want to be? What do I want to give? In every room I've gone into, even some of the rooms where I think the phobia is rife, people treat me well because I come in with a smile and I come in with an energy. And sometimes I come in with that energy that says, don't fuck with me. There has to be performance because once you raise your camera and say, I'd like to take a photograph of you, They'll fix their hair. Some people look in a mirror. They'll always say, how am I? I just want to photograph you as you are. I document people that I find interesting visually. I can't do the theory, but I, I can show what I think through images. And so performance is the performative act of presenting oneself on a day-to-day -day basis. The images of gay men were always white gay men. Your images of black men were your sports stars, your pimps, and then your drug pushers. I could then not relate to these images that I, I was seeing around masculinity. Because we were always being watched, there was also a sense of that performance. Like, who are we, you know, as a group, as a collective? Who's watching us? You know, the police watching us? Are our neighbours watching us? If there is a performance, I want the clothes to be noticed you're not really going to blend into the background. There's going to be something that sticks out, whether it's the shape, the fabric or the colour. I always found a way to give a performance, sometimes even just walking down the street. Camouflage, identity, belonging, security, money, conjures up a whole load of things tailoring. It's a suit of armour, I always call it. If I put on a pair of jeans, my whole mindset changes. But when you put a suit on, it just lifts you up. That's an exceptional piece of clothing to have, something that's specific for you, tailored to you. Men's tailoring is, is fantastic. I mean, I would do a tailored jacket, but it would be in a leopard animal print. It wouldn't be in a traditional tweed or men's cloth. You know, I've done waistcoats for Mick Jagger. You could say that's tailoring. Women's wear is more like tailored towards like things being either very much attached to the body or like highlighting certain areas where I feel like men's wear is all about building onto the figure. With Usher, it was more about like deconstructed tailoring. So I was looking at having it as a crop jacket and then also like the detachable sleeves, which kind of existed on top of the jacket instead of underneath the jacket. Also like raising exactly where like the opening of his tie would be. The highlight and, and the recognition I got was doing the England shirt. 
They wanted something really British, which was really strange because they went to Rolls-Royce, they went to Savile Row. They wanted a new angle. So they said, if you were to design a shirt for England, what would you do? And I said, I'd make it bespoke. You know, every shirt made for each player. I measured every player, neck sizes, long, short, medium fittings. I made it as though I was making a suit for them. The whole strap line was tailored for England. In my father's day, you weren't being respectful if you weren't wearing a suit. In his day, there was only one suit, and it was for best, and you wore that when you wanted to impress someone, or trying to get money from the bank. If you want to be accepted as a man of substance, you, you put your suit on. Over time, and you see it in Casey Haver's work, we begin to deconstruct that, because we begin to sort of challenge our parents' ideas about you know, what we should be doing and like, how we should be dressing. first suit that I ever bought whilst at uni, saved up my money, was a Joe Casey Hayford suit. Joe, for me, became almost a bit like my North Star. There weren't ever any designers that looked like me. The first thing that I liked about him was his sense of style. There was so much detail. This beautiful patchwork armchair takes all of its visual cues from one of Joe's logos. The playing card, the spade, the club, the heart and the diamond, reconfigured with offcuts of leather. I like the way that the trousers were slightly shorter. They just kiss the top of the boots. The way that double breasts were kind of slightly off centre. Tailored pieces that he did were, were sort of really unusual and just beautifully executed. The way in which Joe would create silhouettes and detailing was second to none, always really ahead of his time. Why does your jacket look like that? Why do you conform like that? Why isn't it like this? What happens if you take it apart? What if you took the sleeves off and, and replaced them with something else? What if you cut in half and you added a coat? He always managed to get people to do things way out of their comfort zones. The idea of taking one garment and fusing it with another. Joe was doing this like way before you know, anyone really understood what that was. Joe was essentially a bit of a pace setter. Joe created twisted denim jeans. Levi's came out with twisted jeans. Princess Diana, first fashion show that she ever went to was a Joe Casey Hayford show. This t-shirt from one of his collections, which today as a slogan might raise eyebrows, but this links back to when Martin Luther King was walking through Memphis with the sanitation workers. And many of those sanitation workers would have the slogan saying, I am a man. And the fact that as black people going through the civil rights and still often to this day, we have to defend who we are as in individuals to be able to have some form of equity, never mind some form of equality. That shows you the calibre of where the work was. And to sustain that for such a long time is, is nothing short of amazing. So the story just needs telling. You don't always get a prize for coming first. Being a trailblazer is full of pressure. I like to be taken on my merit. I don't want to be known as a black designer. That's why people know of me. I want people to pick up a piece of garment and say, oh, that's a Charlie Allen, that's fantastic. He was a great designer. A lot of work is about creating those images that I needed to see as a young black queer boy growing up in a small town in Huddersfield. It's much easier knowing that there was someone else who'd done it before. I don't know, maybe someone might have seen like the Met Gala and be like, oh, maybe one day I could probably do that as well too. Sometimes you have to see it to know whether it's possible. What you've got to do is look for the next generation to carry it on. <laughs>